Parents first consulted me three days following her most recent surgery, the fifth in 14 months because of shunt failures. They described how their five and one half year old daughter had been managing fairly well but now was in a state of panic and having nightmares. When I first met Julia, she looked like a frail girl with dark, frightened eyes far younger than her chronological years. We sat at the table in my playroom, Julia huddled on her father's lap. My reassurance that I was not the kind of doctor she was used to, and comments regarding her understandable anxieties about meeting a stranger, helped Julia begin to talk. Anxiously and bitterly, she complained about her sister hating her and calling her crazy. I said I could see how much she disliked her sister for these things. She nodded, continuing her rebukes. When I commented that maybe she was a bit worried that she was indeed crazy, Julia gave a quick affirmation of, uh-huh, moved off her father's lap, and began to draw. Julia was clearly a girl with a great deal on her mind. She was angry as she described her perception that family members were mean to her, an attitude I was to later understand as originating in her sense that the doctors and her own body were attacking her. Her profound sense of unfairness and feeling rejected extended to the world at large, as she talked about a girl who had her been her best friend but wasn't anymore. I'm my own friend now, was Julia's sad solution. As the childish figures in her drawing became more like scribble, words like pea brain, upside down and backwards were uttered. I verbalized her feeling that she was upside down and her brain was on backwards. <coughs> Julia then relayed her story of how she had been very sick when she was a baby, and we talked about how confused and mixed up she got, often forgetting things. Julia had indeed been a sick little baby. She was first hospitalized 20 days after her birth. Spinal meningitis was suspected, but a CAT scan indicated a bilateral intraventricular hemorrhage. At 12 weeks of age, due to the development of hydrocephalus, a ventricular peritoneal shunt was implanted. This promise, prognos, the prognosis did not seem promising, but to everyone's surprise, Julia made remarkable progress. At 18 months, helped by her mother and physical therapy, Julia began to walk. By two years of age, it was thought by all that she was completely recovered. No noticeable difficulties were observed, and developmentally, Julia remained on target. From 18 months to four years of age, she was viewed as a normal child without problems. However, with the onslaught of five emergency surgeries in 14 months, her parents who had provided her with a secure holding environment were no longer able to protect her. In addition, they too were anxious and Julia's future was uncertain. An important question to consider in thinking about Julia is what impact her original hemorrhage and shunt failures had on her brain. At the time of the referral, Julie was having trouble finding her way around, especially at school. She got lost going from room to room, was easily confused about the location of things, and had trouble remembering. At the same time, she did well with puzzles, knew her numbers and letters, and had an uncanny ability to recall in detail stories which were read to her. How much of this behavior was due to her seemingly massive internal disorganization resulting from trauma? Or what might be due to neurological damage with the possibility of learning disabilities? What Was it Julia's mind that was causing her trouble? Was it her brain? Or was it both in concert? There is increasing evidence of a close tie between the mind and the body and how the neglect of these interactions can have harmful consequences. Perhaps in no other area is this interaction more clear than an illness. Studies with children suffering from juvenile diabetes conducted by George Moran at the Middlesex Hospital and the Anna Freud Center in London demonstrated that the control of blood sugar levels over the long term varies with the quality of the child's psychological adjustment. But the reverse is also true, that the stability of diabetic balance profoundly affects the likelihood of adequate psychological adjustment. Thus, personality development and the experience of diabetes are interwoven. While stating that there may be patients who truly have or develop abnormal insulin responsiveness, Moran goes on to describe how this work validates other researchers' contentions. That diabetic children whose lives are repeatedly disrupted by episodes of hypo or hypoglycemia are exhibiting symptoms of emotional disturbance and need psychological intervention. Anna Freud, in an attempt to understand the complexities of child development and as, and as a consequence, child analytic technique, 
always considered the importance of constitutional, environmental, and maturational factors, as well as their mutual interaction. Personality formation was thought to be influenced not only by contributions from the child's internal and external worlds, but also by what the child comes into the world with. Somehow all these influences gather together and make the individual who he is. Anna Freud theorized that they were subjected to the egosynthetic function. A more contemporary psychoanalytic theory would also incorporate a neurological perspective, but what Anna Freud says about the process of integration still seems to apply. Integration, she said, serves healthy growth, provided the elements synthesized by it remain within the limits of the expectable norm. But it is the hallmark of the synthetic function that while it is doing its work, it does not distinguish between what is suitable and unsuitable, helpful or harmful for the resulting picture. Thus, every step along the developmental line, besides being a compromise between conflicting forces, also requires an amalgam of beneficial with malignant ingredients. The various mixtures which thereby can produce can be held responsible for the numerous variations, deviations, quirks, and eccentricities displayed in the final personality." Dorothy Burlingham and the Hampstead Clinic's child analytic studies of the blind and deaf clearly demonstrated in regards to endowment that any single defect in the individual's inborn equipment suffices to throw the entire developmental course into disarray, far beyond the sphere where the damage itself is located. Not only the influences of endowment can have a dramatic effect, but anything which impacts an individual beyond his control, as can be the case with illness and medical interventions. Illness and pain are part of every child's life experiences. Anna Freud described the ways in which the physically ill child has to renounce ownership of his body, permit it to be handled by someone else, and do so passively. Being ill almost always initiates developmental regressions, especially in areas where a child is gaining increased responsibility for his body management and safety. This developmental line involves taking charge of and adequately implementing the tasks required for the care of one's own body, for example, eating, sleeping, toileting, grooming. But incorporated into these tasks are also complicated issues related to the child's own investment in their body, such as self-esteem, body image, and identity formation. Lizzie, who was analyzed by Ms. Ronnie Shaw in Denver, demonstrates these issues vividly. At birth, after an uneventful pregnancy and delivery, Lizzie was found to suffer from hypo and hypo hypoxia and hypoglycemia. Her thyroid levels were low and she was having seizures. Her doctors discovered some right side heart failure secondary to an upper airway obstruction, which was due to malformed bones in around her mid-face. In addition, her nose was not open and there was a posterior displacement of the tongue. Panhypopituitarism was diagnosed. Lizzie spent approximately two months in the neonatal ICU. Her mother recalled being told that Lizzie's facial bones were crushed and malformed, although she looked relatively normal, and that she might not live. Five days after discharge, Lizzie was readmitted due to periorbital cellulitis. A visiting nurse helped to feed Lizzie at home, as her nose was not sufficiently patent for several months. At 13 months, Lizzie, now hypoglycemic, was again hospitalized. As her growth had slowed from 50% at nine months to below 5% on the growth charts, she was started on growth hormones and soyocorta. Lizzie was now deficient in all of her pituitary hormones. Lizzie was four years and four months when she was referred to Ms. Shaw for an evaluation. Her medical condition was being managed with hormone injections every other day administered by parents, frequent blood draws, and oral medicine four times a day. The referring pediatrician observed that the mother had tremendous difficulty managing Lizzie, who was indeed a handful. She was oppositional, had temper tantrums, which prompted physical intervention by parents, was enuretic, having never been completely trained, and had difficulty socializing in age-appropriate ways. Lizzie's disruptive behavior was constant and resulted in both of her, for her and her parents' enormous despair. 
Lizzie presented as a pretty, sad-looking, well-proportioned girl who was extraordinarily small for her age. Ms. Shaw described her first contact. Lizzie was unkept, dressed in unmatched clothes with dirty, broken fingernails and damp pants that smelled of urine. She sat in a far corner facing the wall, sucked her thumb, and looked frightened. She picked at her skin and at her nails. She would not talk, though she showed some curiosity about the toys in the office. Lizzie started to take off her clothes to be examined. Unprepared for the visit, she thought I would examine her as a medical practitioner does. When I said that I was a person who helped with worries and hurt feelings, she became excited and anxious. Mournfully, she said she wanted to show me all of the holes from her shots. She got a terrible lot of shots, she said, shaking her head sadly. <clears throat> Lizzie had little investment in her body or in its care, nor did she have any sense of ownership of her body. With resignation, she was prepared to turn her body over to Ms. Shaw. Her parents had their own difficulties being invested in their daughter or her body, feelings made worse by the battles over giving her the required medications. Her mother's view was also tainted with uncertainty and anxiety, and the early words from the doctors, as she wondered if Lizzie looked deformed or normal, and how would she look when she was older? Both mother and child views Lizzie's body as damaged. Each child would react to illness in his own way. The task the child faces is, made, is to make sense of the experience of the illness, then to integrate it in adaptive ways into his ongoing development. The child's capacity to do this depends on the nature, severity, and duration of the illness, on previous life experiences, on current environmental circumstances, and on his developmental capacities. Because children often don't distinguish between the effects of the illness itself and the effects of medical and nursing procedures, which are carried out for the sake of getting better, the resulting medical interventions also have consequences. But children, by their very nature, are adaptive and strive to master their circumstances. Some following an illness show increased maturity, whereas others return to the level of functioning they had previously established. However, for other children, especially if the illness is prolonged, the impact on development and personality formation is more dramatic. Julia and Lizzie are examples of this. In order to help children learn about their bodies, health, illness, and treatment procedures, it is important to know how they understand these issues. As Peter Bloss Jr. has eloquently described, and I quote, children are researchers. Their range in curiosity includes their own bodies, how they function, and why things go wrong, as they inevitably do. For every question there must be an answer, which the child obtains by a mixture of observation, thought, fantasy, previous experience, and prior explanation. But the effectiveness of this research is limited by intruded affect, and the child's current level of cognitive functioning, need for depends, defense, and opportunities for observation." End quote. In detailing a variety of studies, Bloss goes on to explain that the single common element that makes the preparation for hospitalizations and medical interventions successful is the provision of factual information concerning the things the child will be experiencing. The ways in which children's knowledge base and cognitive capacities grow is through the learning of new facts, words, examples, and experiences. In preparing children for hospitalization and or medical procedures, as well as in the explanation of illness, it is important that the information be as simple and true as possible and be keyed into the child's capacities. However, the process of providing information and the child receiving it correctly is a complicated one. Children in the process of learning often fool adults, adults into believing they understand an explanation for their illness and can hold seemingly contradictory explanations simultaneously. Furthermore, there are difficulties representing and understanding an illness, which is not only beyond cognitive abilities of a pre-adolescent child, but is distorted by anxieties and affects. Mm -hmm. Children who have suffered from a severe illness apply meaning to what has happened to them within these limited capacities, and construct theories and fantasies which can persist even when reality is overlaid which contradicts them. These theories can then skew personality development and relationships of self and others. Let us turn again to Julia, 
the five and one half year old girl with multiple surgeries because of shunt failures. In her third evaluation session, Julie used the family dolls to enact a scene where the baby fell out of bed and crawled out of the house onto, into traffic. The mother repeatedly rescued her from this dangerous situation, but in the end was unable to and the baby was run over by a car. As the baby was rushed to the hospital, Julie reminded us that we were pretending. The baby overheard the doctor say she would have to have an operation. Then she was snatched from her mother's arms and taken away. Quickly, Julie had the family at home and all secure and changed the plane. She complained that her thumbs itched, then her back, scratching and lifting her dress to reveal her stomach. I have something to show you that you've never seen before, she told me, pointing to her scar. When I asked, she explained that this was from an operation a long time ago, then continued by noting with pleasure that they did not have to operate there last time. Julia had been able to clearly and succinctly explain to me about her illness, operations, and the reasons for them. But what is hinted at in the above session, and later confirmed through her analysis, is that underneath what she knew to be true was an unconscious theory that she had somehow done something to hurt herself and was to blame for her illness. She also revealed that out of all of the medical interventions she had been subjected to, the one that was experienced as traumatic, was when she was taken from her parents before she was anesthetized. Usually, Julia fell asleep in her mother's arms and woke up there after the surgery. This time, at the age of four and a half, the induction room at the hospital was not available and this normal routine could not be followed. It was then that Julia first became noticeably anxious with sleep and separation difficulties, responses which subsided but did not disappear. Bergman and Anna Freud describe how frequently children view surgery, medical illness, interventions as punishment and as a consequence for their own behavior. Lizzie, the four-year-old with an endocrine disorder analyzed by Ronnie Shaw, beautifully describes her experiences of feeling that she was being punished, her need for clarification, and her anger at adults' lack of honest explanation. As Ms. Shaw described in the quote, Lizzie voiced bitter complaints about her shots. She was confused about the need for her shots and asked for and needed an explanation. As the material was explored, I told her that she was confused because of all the attention to her body, when she herself could not find a thing wrong with it. She understood my explanation that the medicine which was put into her body was needed to add an important ingredient that was not being made by her pituitary gland. This then made her body work like other children's bodies. The parents thought this an ingenious and simple explanation. They had not been able to convey much more than their anxiety and frustration, as their focus was around the upset of getting shots. Lizzie was enormously pleased by this explanation and tried it over and over in her own words. Lizzie now knew what was wrong with her body and understood that the shots were a way to help her. The family struggles over the administration of her medications then settled. As Izzy worked this explanation over, she proudly announced her body was like everyone else's. She now felt she had a normal body which was worth investing in. This freed her to begin to explore the meaning she had made of the shots. One day Lizzie said, hey, wait a minute, I have a question. If the shots are good, how come they hurt so much? Ms. Shaw told her that she was mixed up about the shots because she had been told that they were supposed to be good medicine, but they did hurt a lot. Yep, you got it, Lizzie had said sorrowfully. If they felt bad and they went into her, how could she be good with bad stuff in her? Or how could the medicine be good if it hurt when it went in? How could doctors be good if they hurt her? Lizzie's theory that was that she was being punished for her bad behavior and her angry feelings and that shots were the way in which parents controlled naughty children. At a later point, Lizzie began to actively avoid her analyst com comments, sometimes drowning them out with gibberish songs. Ms. Shaw said that she proudly, probably felt that what adults said to her about herself and her body sounded like the songs she was singing, not understandable. In response, Lizzie was significantly less ang anxious. She was pleased her analyst understood that adults could talk nonsense and lie as well. Lizzie was then worried that Ms. Shaw would do the same. 
Susanna, on the other hand, had different feelings. Congenital muscular dystrophy was diagnosed when Susanna was 18 months old. She began analysis with me when she was five. Like many parents with a disabled child, Susanna's tended to be overindulgent, having great difficulty setting appropriate limits, fueled by their feeling that they could not fix her disability or the restrictions it imposed on her. Work with the parents involved helping them come to terms with their daughter's disability, a process which needed to be reworked with the entrance of each new developmental phase. Understanding what they could and could not protect their child from and providing reasonable expectations and consequences. In regards to Susanna herself, she often insisted that she liked being different and liked having muscular dystrophy. While an attitude toward the reality of such a life circumstances is at times adaptive and can be used to promote successful developmental progression, Susanna had established an omnipotent sense of self and was using her disability to define herself as special. In these ways, she tried to defend against feeling worthless and damaged, and the painful realization that she wasn't like everyone else. The feelings and anxieties generated by illness and medical interventions can easily become entangled with past and ongoing dilemmas associated with dependency and independency, identity formation, especially gender identity, and body image. A poem written by a 16-year-old boy on Hunter IV, which is the adolescent ward at the Yale New Haven Hospital, serves as an example. He was admitted because of testicular torsion. Hunter IV would be a bore if a pretty nurse didn't stop by my door. As long as they call me honey and sweetie pie, I do not think that I will ever die. This boy seems to be expressing not only his concerns about being well cared for, but also ones about his body and male prowess. Guthrie had similar concerns, but expressed at the level of a much younger child. When he was diagnosed HIV positive at 20 months of age, Guthrie was subject in a research project which required frequent blood draws and medications. In response, he became defiant and uncooperative, withheld his feces, and his development went to skew as he fought to gain some control over his body and its care. His parents decided to pull Guthrie out of the research project to do what was minimally required to keep his health stable and brought him for psychotherapy. At six years old, Guthrie is doing much better. He demonstrated his secure sense of body integrity and a growing esteem up for himself as a male the day he told me to dream. Jill, listen, he began. I had the most wonderful dream. I was on the swings at school, and on my lap was a great, big, beautiful snake. I swung higher and higher and higher. It was fantastic. My teacher came and watched me. She smiled and said, awesome. When a child faces surgery or medical interventions, he has to cope with both the painful and unpleasant reality and defend against the fears and fantasies which the procedures arouse. The aim of interventions when a child is preparing for medical procedures is to support effective coping mechanisms and to modify ineffective defenses. However, as Earl describes in her work with children faced with an amputation of a limb, there is often very little time for preparation. Perhaps, Earl states, the consequences of major surgery cannot be fully anticipated and worked through in fantasy. Although some grieving can be achieved in anticipation, the reality has to be faced directly. Post-operatively, these children will need to help to face this reality, to express their anger and to grieve, and the adults around them will need to help accepting the anger which is directed towards them. It is not only important to explain procedures and illnesses to children in ways that they can understand, but to carefully monitor how the child responds during convalescence and how its development is proceeding. Caregivers need to be available and willing to talk about these issues, even initiate discussions, and provide vehicles for expression. Symptoms indicating the child may be having difficulty include mood swings, outbursts of anxiety, changes in relationship to parents or siblings, or in the way in which the child views himself, a loss of self-confidence, tantrums, bedwetting or soiling, feeding or sleep disturbances, and the development of various phobias, including school phobias. These are some of the signs the child may be incorporating the illness and our procedures in ways which are potentially toxic and disruptive. 
Psychotherapeutic intervention is then helpful to unravel what theories the child has developed to explain what has happened to him. Theories which are riddled with anxiety and what other feelings are attached to the content. For example, anger, rage, and revenge feelings, or masochistic submission, guilt, or depression. The child may also need help learning to cope with the after effects, whether these include continued medical interventions, a change in body image, a disability, or impending death. Furthermore, stopping a medical treatment because it is no longer needed can also cause confusion. When a child has understood that he needs a certain medicine to stay alive, behind his new knowledge that he no longer needs it because he is well, is often distorted ideas. For example, that there is no longer enough medicine to go around, or that he doesn't get any more because of something he has done wrong. It is therefore important to also evaluate these children at the end of medical treatments. Illness and medical interventions may also be experienced as traumatic. In these instances, there are additional issues related to the direct impact of trauma itself, which the child needs help coping with. These are manifested in expectable post-traumatic symptoms, such as persistent re-experiencing of the trauma, avoidance of stimuli associated with the trauma, or either a generalized numbing or increased arousal of the responsiveness. As Ted Gainsbauer has illustrated, trauma reverberates developmentally in multiple ways. The resolution of, fat past, uh, the resolution of phase-specific tasks being worked on at the time of the trauma are not only affected, but past and future development both shape and are shaped by traumatic experiences. Julia, for example, was in a traumatized state when her parents first brought her to see me. She was totally overwhelmed. As with five surgeries in 14 months, there had been too many assaults too close together for her to recover and master them all. These more recent traumas then recapitulated the earlier ones which had previously been mastered, causing them to become an issue retrospectively. Julie had called a halt to thinking and feeling and tried to remove herself mentally, in addition to the fact that she was at the mercy of her own aggressive impulses and fears of being attacked and attacking which further complicated her inner world and ability to function. My initial aim was to contain Julia's anxiety and affects, thus relieving some of the strain she and her family were under. Furthermore, multiple evaluations and testing by medical professionals were required in the near future, which could, without help, re-traumatize Julia further. A session in the early months of her analysis serves as an example. Julia brought me a picture of a boat looking distinctly like a person in a box. When I interpreted her fear of thinking and a feeling, she said, I have two feelings to tell you. When I have an operation and they call my name, I get scared. I hope I never have to have an operation again. When they put me to sleep, but she could not go on, I can't get my words out right. I suggested we draw as a way to help her. She drew herself in a hospital bed and asked me to write the words, Doctors, will you promise not to do it to me again? Sometimes I'm afraid I'm going to die. We could then identify how afraid she was to go to sleep in case she didn't wake up again. She talked further about her operations, the smells of the room, and going to sleep in her mother's arms. She added, once when I was a baby, the day doctor snatched me away from Mommy. Mommy told me so, revealing her terror of a repetition. She stacked blocks, seeing how many she could carry, but they all fell. Then she asked if I could hold them all. When I verbalized her wish to know if I could hold all of her scary feelings, she said, uh-oh, something is going to come out of my mouth. I get scared they'll operate and not even tell me. We identified her desire to know what was going on, no surprises, and then her fear that an MRI wasn't what mommy said, but would be an operation. In contrast is the story of five-year-old Melinda. Her parents brought her to see me a few months after she was bitten in the neck by a dog, which resulted in emergency surgery. At the time of the referral, she was terrified of all dogs. Through our brief time together, Melinda's parents were able to show her and encourage her that some dogs were indeed safe, at which point Melinda's anxiety was alleviated and she was able to give up her symptom. In sessions with me, she anxiously referred to her hospitalization and surgery initially, but it did not surface again. While this experience of medical interventions had been unpleasant and certainly frightening, 
It had not been traumatic, and it appeared that she had been able to cope with it fairly well. However, Melinda's style of managing her internal conflicts and anxieties was to work to please the adults in her life. This approach to the world was used to deal with her experience of her initial trauma and the subsequent medical interventions. The important question is whether Melinda was able to relinquish her symptom in her own right, in other words, because she had mastered the anxiety and resolved the consequences, or was it in an attempt to do what she thought her parents wanted her to do? If the latter is true, difficulties may surface at a later date. Thus, the conclusion of our work together was to wait and see. Parents would continue to observe her, watching for other ways the trauma could reverberate. Because Melinda, her parents, and I have established a relationship, they will return for further consultation if the need arises. A final word about children suffering from terminal illness. Children's concepts of death and their ability to comprehend the finality of death will influence the grieving process. There is no definitive understanding of the meaning that death has before the age of four or five, but children who have seen death will have a precocious understanding. They may face their fear directly or deny them, showing more immediate fears of pain or separation. Parents may also deny their fears or carry out mourning in advance, sometimes seeming somewhat detached from the child at the end, but then experience depression or guilt after the child's death. The important thing is for the child and his parents to have someone to whom they can relay their experience and express their thoughts and feelings rather than maintain an unrealistic silence. As the ones who are trying to help a child and his family through these difficult experiences, we are often disturbed by our own feelings, especially during a child's terminal illness. It is therefore equally important that we seek support and guidance in order to help those who are entrusted in our care. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the, these were all relatively young children that yes. you described. Could you give us some of your thoughts about the differences in maybe a latency age child or late latency or pre adolescent child? Yes, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a child's understanding of the illness is going to be incorporated within whatever their cognitive capacities are at the time. And these young children don't, they're not great cognitive capacities. Latency age children, it's much better. So that how much that they are able to understand and the details that they can understand will be greater than a young child, as will an adolescence as well. Um, and whatever age the child is in, the illness, the interventions are going to be incorporated into whatever their developmental tasks are at the time. So which is going to be different from a young child, for example, than a latency child or from an adolescent. Well, I don't know so how do you experience the change the cognitive capacities of development and how can achieve in that regard? Well, because they've seen some if they've seen someone who's died, there's a reality that person is gone forever. It's not like they've gone away and they're coming back. Or they've been to a funeral and seen a coffin going to the ground. So they're gonna have an understanding of that that a child who has not had that kind of experience will have. It the understanding mean, is the loss of the present. Right, exactly. And it won't be regained. Right. Although there may be always a fantasy of some sort that it will be. An adult I analyzed had lost a grandfather in her latency years who um, was a very endearing grandfather. And what came out in this analysis was that she still had this unconscious fantasy that he would come back. And once that came to conscious awareness, I mean, the grief was absolutely enormous. <clears throat> Most people believe that children don't understand the age of 12. Mm -hmm. That the partial dimension of 45 and that. That's probably right. What they understand at that point is, uh, as you say, related to the cognitive capacity and. Uh, a peculiar concept. The people in Cleveland have studied this in 
they need them and given a lot of examples. But they have it's a partial concept of that. Yeah. For example, the child may say, they may know that the person that is there is not coming back, but it's winter and it's cold. And a uh, little girl will go to the friend and say, who is going to give mommy a blanket? Mm -hmm. Or Freud gave a very good example, I put in one of his papers of the 12 year old child, a very clever child, whose father had died, who uh, one day repeated at the table, I understand that father is dead, he's dead, but I don't understand why he doesn't come to dinner. <laughs> and you see, the way we handle that, that's a fact. Yeah. So you don't understand it. If anybody does, but perhaps the label that an adult does understand it, uh, it takes about 11 to 12 years of age before you get there as a child. And then, of course, as you say, it depends on what experiences they have had, how they would see. You see, for some, they say that they saw a dead dog, but as far as they are concerned, the dog is sleeping. I may not wake up, but children that, uh, let's say, have seen that happen may well become public of going to sleep. Because maybe they won't wake up uh, like the dog. So it's, it's, it's a partial concept of death. You know, it never, it's not a really uh, full understanding of it. And of course, they frequently do, or at least in my experience, they experience all the ministrations of the physicians and nurses and things of that kind as aggressive. Mm -hmm. Behavior towards them that are related, as you rightly said, to the fact that they have been bad. They deserve it's a punishment. Remember that when I first came to Tampa, I went to, they asked me at Moffitt to give a lecture on uh, to the nurses that were dealing with children mm -hmm. whose death was imminent through leukemia or whatnot. These nurses of course, we're in a very special situation because they got very attached to these kids. And of course, we're constantly losing them, you know. And it was a real tragedy, and so they needed a special help. But what was interesting is that many of them were very upset because the children didn't understand that they were trying to help and didn't like them. In fact, reacted very badly to their presence because they came with the jobs and yeah. hurt them and so on. And as far as they were concerned, since they don't understand illness either, uh, except for the concoction that they may be able to be given by adults and so on, but they, it's like, like telling children about sexuality when they don't have the complete capacity of the body experience to be able to make any sense of that. So they make a, a special concoction and they were very upset because they tried so hard to help these children to alleviate their suffering and potentially to save their life and the children hated them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they were mourning the losses of the time. They couldn't understand that the children didn't see them as helpers because that's people that were hurting them. Yeah. My experience with a number of these kids is that um, who are not terminal or who have not, you know, I mean, they've gone in for these procedures and then they leave. But there is an understanding, yeah. there's one level of an understanding that um, the doctor's there to help. And they do have a sense that this doctor's a very important person in this ability for them to hopefully feel better. And that nurses are kind of on the border. So that <laughs> the aggression and the anger is very rarely, I think, directed towards the doctors because they're such they're so needed, and the poor parents are the ones who get the brunt of a, a lot of this aggression. You know, many years ago, I wrote a paper: children' reaction to the death of important objects. Mm -hmm. and so I, and um, of course, it's related to the understanding of this. I had a neighbor when I was in London. That uh, there was a gentleman that they had two children, and a little girl about four years of age, or four and a half years of age, and this man dropped one day dead out of the corner. He wasn't shot, he wasn't killed or anything, just dropped dead one day. And the little girl was very uh, sorry about losing her. Father, in a way that a child is sorry because they don't mourn. They 
you know, they, they as you know, they don't do any moment uh, that particular point in time. They react to the anxiety of the adults around them and the mother's sadness and so on, but otherwise, in dating, they want to see the cartoons or uh, listen to the music and uh, things of that kind. In any case, a year later, this little girl will, will talk to you, I know them, I know the family. She will say, my dad is dead. <coughs> say, yeah, yeah, he can come. But when her birthday came, a year later, mm -hmm. the mother came, my neighbor across the road, knocked at the door, and said, Dr. Mm -hmm. Naira, can you help me? She was devastated because it is her person, and her father had to send her a present or call her on the phone. You see, it's a translocation for children. It's not really a total phenomenon. It's, uh, and it's really different for all of them, so it's a very interesting uh, experience whenever you get across them. Mm -hmm. I was struck as you were talking about these children subjected to medical intervention, the similarities between those children and children who had suffered episodes of abuse. That somehow they've been bad, they did something to cause it, if they've been better. Uh, have you made those? You know, children, especially young children, are, you know, they understand the world in terms of being in the center of it. Okay. So if bad things happen to them, and there is an immediate sense that they must have something to do with it, that they caused it in some kind of a way. So I think it's true. So those sorts of fantasies get woven in with children that abuse, with these kinds of kids that I'm talking about, with in all sorts of circumstances. But somehow, whose parents are divorcing. Yes. You know, it really doesn't doesn't matter what the issue the may be. From right. From from mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. And a child's need to understand something or make sense of something is related to uh, the phase of development that they're in, the issues that they're they're dealing with, and the way that their mind you know puts the information together. Whether it's what they've been bad or that they hated their sibling. But the fact is that chicken are egocentric for many years of their life, <laughs> up to the age of uh, probably nine. And so anything that happens is related to something that they have done. They are at the center of the world. Nothing happens around them that is not related to them or caused by them. And right. they grow out of that period of egocentricity. Mm -hmm then they can understand anything in terms of uh, cause and effect. They solve their fault. And yeah. that's a real tragedy for children. Those conclusions that a child might draw as a young child <coughs> will stay with them uh, if it's not processed, mm -hmm. even though they gain those later capacities. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's <laughs> like anything that you, you know, it's like anything else, any period that you go through that animistic or egocentric and so on, you retain some of that. And if you have had experience stage, you have sort of a fixation to that uh, particular set of events. And anything that happens around you that relates to that reactivates that problem, you know. It's, uh, it's like anything else. It's, uh, yeah, but what is important is that each child will interpret and understand what is happening to them based on their own their own conflicts, whether it's, you know, I think of a little boy who had uh, surgery and his feeling was that it was because he was bad because he had been masturbating. Um, you know, another child that had to do with um, a younger sibling being born and not liking the younger sibling, so the surgery that they had had on their eye was because they had been bad. It was a punishment. So you have to listen to what the fantasies are, right? Uh, which will give you a clue as to what issues they're dealing with. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I came in late. The president was flying into town and they <laughs> stopped all the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I didn't hear the first 15 minutes, but the cases that I did hear were children who had interventions that extended to the point in time where they were pretty verbal. Mm -hmm. 
um, and, and could at least at that time cognitively store in ways and incorporate. How about children pre-2 um, who have medical intervention that does not continue? That may be quite significant at the time it occurs. If you, in that regard, it's very interesting to read Ted Gainsbauer's work, who's done a lot about pre Ted Gainsbauer, who's done a lot about preverbal trauma, and he's talking about single event trauma. These aren't abused children, but the kids who've had some kind of horrible events in their life before they had language, and that these get stored. Um, memory-wise, and that these children, I mean, he has numbers of examples, that these children will come in and given the right environment with the right person and the environment in terms of toys and things, they will play this out. I had one, and I saw him for a very short time, and it wasn't much of an environment, it was first session, and he had had surgery at a very early age on his penis, and he came in, got out a play grill, and put snakes on it. Mm -hmm. Then built a building with an ambulance that went back and forth with a screaming kid at the top. Mm -hmm. and, with, and had no awareness um, from his parents' perspective or remembrance of that at all. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, that was just, to me, amazing. So I, I really watch kids when I first see them now. Yeah. Because I assume the first time they walk in that there's some, whatever they present mm -hmm. is something of extreme significance. And there was no denying Mm -hmm. what he created in that room. I mean, it was really very clear. And then you have to think technically about, about what to do about this. And, you know, is there times when the, the reality and the facts are really important to know? So then the parent is brought in the room and this is, you know, and the, it's really discussed and the words are put to memories, which is sort of working retrospectively, I suppose. And you know, and then the other piece, which is what we're talking about today, is that you know the fantasies that are unmolded through <laughs> development um, as well. Yes, I haven't had any experience with uh, doing therapy with terminally ill children, but I was curious about your experience or other people's in the room. If a child uh, has had experience with death, but uh, they know a person is not coming back, but retain the fantasy that they're somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Then they also must have fantasies that, that this beloved person is not coming back for a reason, to punish them, don't, don't love them anymore, whatever the fantasy. So I wonder if a child has had that experience and then they can discuss or are being, have been told that they will also imminently experience death, they have, what kind of fantasies does that engender? Mm -hmm. Don't worry, mommy, I'll come back to you even if you die, or, or, or what kind of fantasies? I'm curious. You know, my experience isn't that great with terminal children, so um, I, you know, I don't have a wealth of information to be able to share. I'm sure some other people in the room do, but um, the little bit that I have had, and I don't know how to explain this really, so, but I'll throw it out there anyway, which is that, um, you know, this is with older children called my experience as opposed to young children, so kids that are late latency, early ad adolescents, are uh, more, have a better reality base about this fact than their parents do. I mean, they're, they're more open to coming to terms with the fact that they're, this is it, their life is going to end whatever that means to them, um, as opposed to parents who are having a harder time kind of accepting that fact. But you know, it's an interesting, I mean, you're asking kind of, so what kind of fantasies would a child have in that situation? You know, I don't know that I would even explore it. Because, you know, a child's dying, and so what you're trying to do is to help them cope and manage with this the best possible way that they can. Well, regardless of the goal, explored or not explored, you would think <coughs> through listening and play, you would hear or know about some of the fantasies, and I'm curious mm -hmm. what they are. Mm -hmm. like other people have experience with that as well. I think it's unpredictable. It's totally unpredictable. You see, we, uh, it depends. Where the child grew, what he knows, what kind of religion the family practices, 
what he had been told about all the people that have dead or died or friends that have died, where they went to heaven or went here to other places. In fact, we don't believe from, from death. We, we, you know, at least most people don't believe from it. They think of it as a translocation. You either will go to hell or go to heaven or go or reincarnate or whatever it is. But uh, And so it depends. It's frequently people ask you, well, what would you tell a child who has been through such an event, let's say lost the mother or father? And usually what you tell them is tell them whatever it is that you have raised, whatever belief you have raised them on, use that for the time being. They cannot understand anything different. And if you told him that people, their mother went to God in heaven, that's what you tell them. It's a, it's a white life. I have personally more difficulty possibly than other people saying that, but I will do it because that's, that's in the context of the child life experience. And it's about the kind of thing that you can do at a point in which he had no capacity to understand the complexity of the problem that he faced. So it depends. You see, some children that are told, oh, you, uh, you know, uh, when people die, they, they become angels and go to heaven, which is not uncommon. So the story told to children, you know, <coughs> they, they became an angel. But in fact, I was told that about a friend of mine that died when he was a little boy. They told me, oh, he's an angel now in heaven. And at the time, I thought, well, he's an angel in heaven now. I wish it was true. I don't think he's an angel in heaven now, but at the time, that's what I believe. Now, had anything happened to me, that's what I would have played with, you know. So it is unpredictable. It depends on what the life circumstances are, what the cognitive capacities of the child are, how intelligent he is, how, you know, much he has grown out of that egocentric stage and so on, and can take some distance from certain things. But the reality of it is, these children up to the age of 11 or 12 cannot understand death as you and I understand it. <coughs> it's a partial concept of death. And that's what they will play with. You know, it's, that's the way it is. So what the people in Cleveland <coughs> were described, they have a story, this uh, ad nausea, really. And, uh, they be, so I'm saying, uh, several of the papers that they have uh, described these events, how children react to this. Well, there was a little girl whose mother had died, and she had been told, since she was a little girl, that there were angels in heaven, right? Because that's the way she was raised. That was. God there, and the angels were there, the people that died went there, and the granny went there when she died, and so well. The mother unfortunately died, and before that happened, she had been bought by the mother an angel costume. All right? And they tried to have her wear the angel costume, and she would not be caught dead on that thing. She would be romantic to be an angel in heaven. You know what I mean? Though they say that the mother was already, so it depends on the child. You know, other people have fantasies of reunion, right. for example. Right. So it, it really depends on people's uh, experience. I have a, a one who lost his mother at three, and he didn't have that great grasp of the of language. Everybody said heaven, and he confused it with Texas. So for three years, he thought his mother was in Texas until he could cope with. Her not returning, and uh -huh. then he figured it out. Mm -hmm. I had another uh, woman who was about nine when her grandfather died. A very similar story, and she this is this was amazing to me. She believed he had not died, mm -hmm. and that he was actually walking around, and she was seeing it, and that her parents were refusing to acknowledge his presence mm -hmm. because they didn't want her to be with her grandfather. Mm -hmm. Just and and she for. Two years, she believed that he was there. You know, she, she was actually seeing him. She would be walking down the street, he would be across the street, and her parents wouldn't acknowledge him. Mm -hmm. Just amazing what people do. Yeah, it's very interesting. 
Could you speak to helping parents deal with the upper child and helping them talk to the child about it? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I think we're talking about illness. It, you know, it's these <coughs> parents, for example, um, well, I suppose. Um, Julia's parents, I met with her mother frequently, and once a week when I first started working with her, because the whole family was traumatized at that point, and because she had these five shunt failures so close together, nobody knew why was this happening, and was it going to happen again, and it could happen at any moment. And, and so her mother was hyper vigilant and in an anxious state most of the time. Plus, her kid was pissed off at her. <laughs> so it's trying to help, in that instance, it's trying to help them as best you can, supporting consultations that they were getting. She later developed epilepsy um, and kind of monitoring that together because I, you know, we had very close, we do with analysis, have very close contact. So trying to help in that kind of a way. And also talking about, um, you know, the mother's feeling of failure really, that she had. Why had she produced this child? Why had this happened to my baby? And what that meant to her. And parents go through this. You know, it's very hard. Um, that they're damaged, that they've damaged their child. They've done something wrong. So that that is there as well. Some people have described their stages, various stages in the reaction of parents mm -hmm. to the imminent death of the child. It starts with the face of denial, mm -hmm. and what to happen. Then uh, they become very angry, why will this happen to me, and things of that kind. In the end, uh, doctors get blamed very frequently. It's the doctor's fault. It's, it's not. This mother was finally, they come to that stage where they accept the fact that the child is going to die and it's not all this fault, mm -hmm. but that's the way life is. But before they get there, they go through several stages where a lot of other people get blamed mm -hmm. for them. Frequently, the doctors get blamed for whatever it is that happened, that they didn't diagnose it in time. They didn't use a medication, they made a mistake, they could have saved it if they had done this or the other, and it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are stages that have been mm -hmm. described of how people react to uh, losing a child. And uh, the first stage is one of an absolute denial. Mm -hmm. And frequently it um, creates problems in the marital relationship. Many marriages break down after the death of the child, because the parents blame one another, and sometimes they can't resolve that either. It's also helping, not with the um, death of a child, but in these kinds of situations, you know, there's the, the guilt, and so then there's the also tendency to be overindulgent, and they're raising this kind of bratty children, and then they don't. I can't control them, and you know, and that complicates the guilt as well. So, being able to talk with them, one about that, and identifying what their guilt is, and that it's there, and then what are reasonable expectations to have for this child? Um, Julia was because her um, she could bypass her thinking. If you could engage her cognitive capacity, she was much better. So, when she would get in trouble at home for something. Um, and, you know, her mother would send her to time out or something. She, like, then she'd come out and it was like it never happened. But if you could get her to say what she had done, then she was more likely to register with her. And then she felt bad, and she should have felt bad. And then you can make reparation and have all those sorts of um, kinds of steps. Yes? I'm just old enough in medicine to... Uh Remember when all the children that had leukemia died, 100%. On a matter of fact, the, the first study where there was some five-year survivals was published while I was in medical school. And uh, <clears throat> uh, St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis was the people who did that, and that's where I was in medical school. And one of the things they found very quickly within a year or two 
is that the social workers and everybody else who worked with the children were basically encouraging the parents to be very indulgent. And all of a sudden, these kids started surviving. Mm -hmm. And they had a whole bunch of what you were describing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that were hell on, on wheels because everybody had expected them to die and it took years to get out of that kind of thinking. Now, m most of the children live. Mm -hmm. The other piece is helping parents. I mean, parents have to be able to withstand an enormous amount of affect, right. very intense affect coming from your child. Whether right. it's the anxiety, it's the rage, um, their own, the child sort of disorganized state, whatever. And that's incredible. It's hard for a parent in the best of circumstances. But that's very hard to be able to do. And to be able to contain that, I mean, like you do with any child when you're learning affect regulation, to be able to stand it and survive it, to be able to contain it, um, uh, to be able to reflect back, to be accepting of it and not punitive, um, is a very hard task for parents. They say that that's one of the worst things that can happen to a human being to this child. All the, all the prospective studies on, on grief show that that is the hardest Hardest grief there is. I'm just wondering about uh, parents detaching from their child mm -hmm. you know, as a way of dealing with you know their own anxiety about what's going on and you know and or in terms of you know, fearing the child will will die. Starting to separate. Right, and then kind of handing, you know, handing the child over to you and withdrawing, you know, as well from, you know, from the treatment and from working. And Mike, we were talking about this candidates earlier that it's not um, so much that it's more of an emotional sin. It's not like the parents aren't there anymore. <laughs> yeah. But that kind of emotional sense of, of pulling back. That's also uh, been reported where the patient sometimes does that in anticipatory grief, pulls away from the family. Mm -hmm. And the families will complain about the same sure. thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's interesting because there are people when they're dying that want to have family around and others who will you know, put their family away. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing, you know, in terms of a little bit of stories that I had recently, how you know, people will be in the hospital room, 
where their parent is dying and you know, talking to each other and completely ignoring, you know, the parent that's in the bed. 